A great meeting point, convenient light meals, hot and cold beverages, or a quick snack on the go? What's your order for the day? We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City Way. Welcome to Real Talk with myself, Anelem Doda. We are in the last week of the year before the holiday season is upon us. The big days, the December. And for many of us, this is a great time for catching up with some of the things that we could not do, like reading and deciding which books to stuff into our suitcases can be quite a task. Worry not, help is on the way. On the show today, you will hear from some of our most celebrated writers, finding out what books they are reading. And we also have something for our cookbook lovers later on. Joining me right now is one of the most respected female writers and one of my favorites. At the age of 13, Angela Marcola had her first short story published in a music and lifestyle publication called Upbeat Magazine. And from that moment, the bug had bitten. And so the journey to write and publish began. She worked as a magazine journalist and public relations consultant for several agencies before establishing her own public relations firm, Bright Spark Communications, in 2002. She burst onto the literary scene in 2007 with her debut novel, Red Ink. It was so good. Uh, and that became the first crime fiction by a black author in South Africa. Imagine that. She has since written three more books, The 30th Candle, The Black Widow Society, and her latest title, The Blessed Girl. Welcome onto the show, my favorite, Angela. I promise you, you, know, you don't know this, but you're gonna make me like a billionaire one day. Oh, how? Ask me how, thank you. I should have a little badge. You make me a billionaire, ask me how. Okay, I'm looking forward to it because I'm sure I'll get royalties out of that you will, billion. You will, because I'm going to take at least three of your books and I'm going to turn them into blockbuster movies, right? Mm. Starting with 30th Candle. Okay. And then Red Ink. Uh -huh. I even have, the, I've cast the Red Ink serial killer, by the really? way. Really? Have yes. you? I'm interested to hear who because I think I saw somebody that would make a great really? Red Ink serial killer. The only problem is he's my ex, so we're going to have to ask him quite oh, nicely. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's not get into that. <laughs> okay. And then, obviously, this one. Uh, but I think we'd have to make the place go first because it's more fitting yeah, it's to much, society. Yeah, it's much more contemporary. Mm -hmm. It's quite fresh. So, yeah, let's start there. Okay, no, no, no. I'll tell you where we want to start. I want to start <laughs> okay. as a young kid. Like, I, I envy authors because I just feel like, I feel stupid. Like, I tried to write an, a, a book one day yeah. and it, it, it ended happened? up sounding like The Born of the Beautiful. <laughs> Well, maybe it's because you've got a very romantic life, clearly. Yeah, I don't <laughs> and know. a glamorous like, one. I was like, ah, this, this story's been written before. Stop it. Look, you start as a young kid at 13, you get published. Yeah. I mean, who tells you you can get published? Why is that in your head? Why are you so daring? Explain yourself. Um, what was going on? Uh, it was a magazine that we read, like, as young people. Like, it yeah. was a teenage, uh, a teen magazine, basically. So I just remember deciding to, because I wrote a lot as a kid. I used to love writing. Mm. I was that child that lived in her head. Um, I used to bore my friends because, you know, I would like stay in the house and they'd want to come out and play with me. And I'd play for like 20 minutes, then run back home and hide in the wardrobe because I'm reading something. I don't want them to interrupt me. So I was that geeky. But who introduced you to books? My dad, okay. my dad. Uh, okay. we, we had tons and tons of books. My dad was a school teacher. He was an English teacher. Oh. So we had all the classics. African uh, classics, Shakespeare, we had everything in the house. So yeah, that's how, in fact, he took us, he took my brother and I to the library, I think when I was about five or six. And the local library, I'm, I'm from Tembisa originally. Mm. So the local library was just a, a walk away from my house. Oh. So from that visit, we just kept on going back. And for me, it just became this love affair. So when do you think we should introduce our kids to books if you want them? Because like my son's two and I'm like, do I start reading to you now? now? He doesn't care. Like I sit there and I'm like, you know, Pinocchio did this and he just slaps the he book. No, start now. Because I started reading from my uh, to my kids at that age. Yeah. And by three, 
I would have my son just like sitting there, kind of like sifting through the book okay. by himself, okay. because it just becomes uh, second, nature. second nature, and that's what you want to inculcate in your children. Mm. So yeah, that's what happened with my kids, and I think with me, uh, study, I was I was around five, six, um, probably six, seven, mm. um, and then I started with those books with those large letters, mm. and then I was very chuffed with myself when you know the le the books, the volume became larger, uh. and the lettering became smaller. Okay. You know, okay. then I'm like thinking, yeah, like, you know. I'm, I've arrived. Yes, I've arrived in the reading world. So, you know, someone like J.K. Rowling, right? So, yeah. you know, you know, Harry Potter comes to her and she's on a train and yes. she's 25. And she's when, a single mom. And, she, you know, when do your books come to you? Because I'll tell you what, I mean, pity that her money is a lot more than yours. <laughs> Thanks for pointing it I, out. I'm, I'm just going to come. <laughs> it's Christmas, by the way. Please Am I out here to books? lie? Am I out here to lie? I ain't never told a lie, okay? But for me, you are, and Harry Potter fans are gonna kill me for this. Please don't fly your broomsticks here and kill me. <laughs> but I just feel like there's a lot more creativity from your end because all your four books are very different, but they're very good. So Thank like, you. Harry can come to her, right? And then she writes and she just develops on that story. Serialized, well done, yeah. brilliantly, phenomenal, love her. Mm. But when do your books come to you? Because you must have been doing four very different things when they came to you. Four very different, okay. good observation. Yeah, very, very different things. So Red Ink, um, I think the story is now like a fable that's well known. It, 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 uh, it started out as, I started out as a journalist following the life of a serial killer, following a serial killer trial, oh. and then wrote to this yeah. person and he was incarcerated. He responded to my letter five years later, then wanted me to write a book based on his life story, was a psychopath in, my, like, in our dealings, and therefore I, 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 I ditched the project. Yes. Then met someone who suggested that I fictionalize uh. the whole relationship and everything. So that's how Red Ink came to be. So it's based on kind of Is he still events. alive? It's Moses. No, it's Moses. So it's not supposed okay. to say it. Okay. <laughs> yes, he's still alive. <laughs> okay, cut, edit. <laughs> <laughs> she said it. Okay. Yes, oh. yes. So that was, the, that was Red Ink. So it was kind of based on mm. real life events, you know, um, or fictionalized account of a real life event. Then 30th Candle, I was turning 30. Yes. Um, Black Widow Society, I'd just gotten married. Oh. No, well, I wasn't about to kill my husband, but. But you were, <laughs> you were in the fold. You were being equipped with the tools to do so. Not that you needed to use them, no, but no, yeah. actually there were a lot of uh, Black Widow stories in the news at ah. the time. A lot of women who had killed their husbands, and For obviously any... being in the space where you are in love and you're newlywed, it just it boggled my mind. It was just a strange thing, uh -huh. uh, and 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 fascinating to me at the same time. Like, why did these women do this? And so I investigated it and found that there was a lot of actually domestic abuse behind mm. a lot of those stories. Mm. Mm. And then I just came up with this idea of a of a secret society and, that allowed women to and wow, how to that. Eliminate. Yeah, I don't know nice. whether, you know, femicide has escalated or it's just that we didn't know about it, but yeah. I mean, you were ahead of the curve when you, re when you wrote that book because look what's happening in the country right now. I think it's always been happening. It's always been it's there. It's always ne? been happening. It's just that it's been reported on more now. Um, and I think we, 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 have a lot, we have a lot of anger in the country. We've got a lot of issues. And men are, are, are feeling very emasculated yeah. as well. And there's just a lot going on, yeah. Anneli. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, the blessed girl, mm -hmm. can I guess how it came to you? And let's then you tell it, me. Let's hear it. You were spending way too much time on social media. <laughs> okay, tick. <laughs> Next. You were spending way too much time uh, at, at, at like these malls, like Mall of Africa and Nickelway and, 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 and like Gateway, and you were just watching them. And you were spending way too much time in hotel lobbies. <laughs> <laughs> so then this came to you. Uh, no, no, you, you only get one tick. <laughs> you only get one okay. tick. But yeah, I mean, it's a social phenomenon. It's all around us. We know, each of us knows at least one person who is living the so-called blessed life, yeah. you know? We know a blessy, we know blessers yeah, yeah. are plenty. So um, it, at first I was dismissive of it because I started observing it on social media. Yeah. And it was just like, who are these girls? And dismissive so young. or judgmental? Because I initially started on a judgmental tip. I started out like, on a judgmental you, But tip. also because mm. why don't you make your own money? Why don't you live yes. your own life? And then you realize, okay, no, but well, first it was curious. Curiosity, how are you making this money? Like True. you're young, we don't see you at the office. I yeah. mean, where's it all coming from? Your skin is so great, your you don't work a day in your life. You know, you look good all the time. Don't you stress? 
when you're making all this money, you know? <laughs> so, so it was all those questions. And then when I saw it around me, then I started actually interacting with girls and talking to them and, you know, just trying to find out what is the lifestyle about. And I found that people were actually very happy in this lifestyle, mm. or that's what, that's what, what they projected. Mm. Um, um, and, and it was a curious thing for me because it was also not girls who are not, it's smart girls as well who mm. are doing this. It's girls mm. who are accomplished, who could mm. do something, who mm. could make potentially their own money. Mm. So that was the curiosity. And then I started kind of investigating. It's a subculture. That's yeah. what I call it, because it, it is. is. It's a subculture. It so I started investigating it and talking to the women and some of the men who were, if, the, the few that were willing to talk, uh, because the girls are more, more I was about to say, do you find that the men are less willing to talk than the women? The men are less willing to talk because A, most of them are married. And B, they're working. And B, they're working. Um, and, and C, there's, there's, there's multiple girls, obviously, sometimes, well, not obviously, sometimes that they are keeping yeah. in this lifestyle. So it's kind of a secret life um, that they're not willing to really kind of sit down and, mm. and have a chat about, you know? Oh, my word. Yeah. Like, what admin? <laughs> it is. It's a lot of admin. I think for both parties. I mean, if I'm like, if if you're juggling three blessers like, yeah, Mo like Monte Monte is. my character, it is a lot of admin, and it's a lot of physical upkeep because yeah. you have to look the part, you know. Sure. Okay. So listen, we're asking the question: What are you reading these holidays? Uh, let us know what books have made it onto your reading list. Uh, you can tag us on our social media pages using the hashtag hashtag Summer Reading on three. We'll be back right after this. We are delving right into this one. It's the latest one from Angela Macola. It's called The Blessed Girl. You want to know more? Come back. You're watching Real Talk, and we're in conversation with a phenomenal writer, Angela Makola, who is on her fourth novel. She became the first black writer to write crime fiction and has come a long way since her debut book of Red Ink. Her latest book, The Blessed Girl, is about what it means to be a young woman trapped by the culture of consumerism and the social media bug. It follows the life of Muntle Tau, who uses her good looks to get what she wants and the opulent lifestyle she lives, supported by the four blessers in her life and the pitfalls of becoming the hashtag Hashtag blessed one. So Angela, I actually call her my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> She's my retirement plan because I'm gonna turn her books into movies and I'm gonna go to Hollywood and I'm gonna hang out. Yeah, you make know. sure that I'm also there, hey. <laughs> yeah, no, every now and then I'll bring her. I'll be like, this is the lady I based you know, the, the, the choices on. She wrote the books, but you know, this is it. <laughs> so let's talk about the blessed one. What I love about it is, and I think that's why I love your books. You 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 grab me immediately, right? Because for somebody who likes to read, I've got a very short attention span. And it's just happened to get shorter. I don't know if you agree yeah, with me. It, yeah, it's getting shorter. I feel the same. And I almost, I, sometimes I actually want to cry because I've got such a huge collection of new books oh. that I've bought that I want to read. But, you know, in between everything, our lives have become so busy. And LA, you know, so many things are fighting for our attention. Yeah. And I never thought I'd be that person who actually battles to get down to read the stuff that I want to read. So that's, I think that's why books like this, yeah. you know, you, you, you increase the pace because readers are demanding, are much more demanding now, you know? And what you do well is, uh, what, what I find some authors get wrong is, you know, people want to write like writers, but the... Writing like writers, it's almost like, you know, Shakespeare, but that's how they spoke back then. So it makes sense that he would write like that. So now when people write and they like writing this English, that's like, and then I art although, and I'm like, what are you doing? Just write the way we speak. <laughs> and talented you writers. <laughs> They're showing off their talents, no. their literary talents. No, you do that well. <laughs> when you write the way that we speak, and yeah. immediately it's like, you know, I'm it's grabbed relatable. by Muntle Tau, and I'm not sure if I like her. And I'm not sure if, you know, no, okay, I'm sure that I've met someone like her. Yes. I'm sure that I've gone to school with someone like her. Certainly. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm wondering how she treated me. So immediately I'm, I'm placing myself, in that you know, situation. again, in the, yeah. how were we to each other? Okay, we're cool, but she was rather nasty to other people. Yes. So actually I didn't like her. I'm actually blessed that I don't have to see her again. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. She's Here in my she room. Here she is, yeah. Here I am, I'm reading about her. Yeah. How did you come up with that character? Um... I think it's very similar to your experience, and, and this is the thing. That's why I'm saying this thing is so, it's ubiquitous. It's all around us because mm. we all know at least one person who reminds us of Buntle. Yeah. So I know a Buntle or two, yeah. you know? Uh, um, and yes, there was the judgment, 
uh, when I started writing the book, there was a lot of judgment actually. But when I got into the character, and this is what writing does, or, 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 at least in my case, mm. that it actually humanizes the subject, it humanizes ah. the character. So you go in with your judgment, but by the end of the book, and I found a lot of people who, who actually started hating her, mm. and some of them have come back to me on social media and said, I hate you for ending it this way, it should have ended differently for her without you know, giving away yeah. too much. Yeah. Um, because people kind of form this emotional attachment to the yeah. character because she's so layered, and this is who we are, all of us. You yeah. know, We're not just one thing. Um, and so I can experience you on one particular day or incident and say, oh, she's such a, uh, mm. you know, but then maybe you had a bad day or something else was happening in your life. Mm. Um, so, so Buntle, she kind of, as I, I, I delved into the character, there were so many layers. I started thinking, what kind of childhood would this person have? What kind of hangups does she have mm. as a human being well, that makes her want to compensate with these luxurious uh, designer yeah, bags, you yeah. know, why does she need to be seen to be so successful? What is it that she's running away from? Yeah. Um, and so when you start kind of, you know, peeling off the surface, then yeah. you find out the real person behind it. And I think when, when you do that, then you, 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 you humanize the person. So she's more than just a blessed girl. In the yeah. end, people who really did not want to like the book yeah. or like the character ended up liking her. Have you ever changed your mind about a character? Mid this is the one. Oh, okay. This is the one. Yeah, this is the one. Where you like, you're taking it this way and you really decided and then through your own words, you convince yeah, yourself and otherwise. I was so unhappy. I wanted to dislike her so much. <laughs> uh, <let's go. laughs> but she surprised me. Yeah, this is the one character. I, and I actually liked her more after I wrote my last The End okay. uh, because of how people were reacting. Because some things that I brought into the book, I still had that, mm, she got it coming. Okay. But to, uh, so when I hear how people read the character, I also have changed my mind about her, even yeah. post you know, publishing the book. And which is when quite it comes a, a strange to thing. It's never happened to me before. Uh, when it comes to the, the business side of it, like, have you ever had an editor say to you, I don't like that part, but you feel it's such an integral part of the book that you had loggerheads about whether you're gonna keep it in or out? Yeah, again, it's happened with Black Widow a lot. We fought a lot with my editor and Blessed Girl. Uh. Um, I fought with a few people with Blessed Girl because I wanted it to end a certain way. Um, and you know, when you write a book like this, you have to be sensitive to the kind of society that you live in mm. um, and the kind of readers that you, you're writing for. Yeah. And my readership for me, I, I respect their intelligence, um, but at the same time, I realize that there's young women as well who read a lot of my work. Yeah. And some, some people would still kind of take out oh, Buntler is mistress of her domain, yeah. of her destiny, because she's really in charge yeah. of her life. She yeah. kind of makes these decisions, really uh, being aware of what, where she wants to go. She's got a plan, you know? And so I didn't want people to think I'm kind of glamorizing this mm. life. But at the same time, I had to show that glamour because it is part of mm. it. She does. And it do, is glamorous yeah, when you're watching glamorous. it. They do go on, uh, you know. Abu Dhabi F1, Abu Dhabi, girl. You know, you know. Like, apparently it's the, the mistress's race. You can't race. take it away from them. <laughs> you can't take it away from them. And there are moments when, as a mistress, she feels that, you know, she's got a far greater life than the, the steady girlfriend or the wife. Mm. And, and, and I have to reflect that because there are moments like that. But at the same time, there are moments in December when she's sitting alone and the blessers are all gone there with their wives and their children and whatnot. And she's thinking, you know, is this really my life? Those moments of reflection. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. So it's kind of a tragic comedy. It, it actually, mm. it is. I can't wait to finish it. I'm, I'm, I'm about halfway. Yeah. And then, it's still on the business side, where, where is the state of books in South Africa? Can you live off it or do you have to do other things? Not quite yet, uh, but we're getting there. I think we're getting somewhere. Okay. The reason I'm saying that is because, for instance, just launching this book as opposed to launching my other books, it was a full house and it was people who had read a lot of my books okay. and they knew. So whereas before, when you go to a book or when you're launching a book, it's kind of like, your uncle and your brother and your brother's, you know, well, I'm like exaggerating. Like in a quiet little coffee but shop you know somewhere. I, but yeah. you know what I mean? It's really changed. The landscape oh, has changed. Good. There's many more South Africans reading. It's really exciting. Okay. And the, there was a Bantu Book Festival yeah. a, a week ago. Yeah. Um, and lots of black, beautiful black people coming out to read in droves. So it's, okay. it's changing. It's definitely changing. All right. So listen, 
This is the book to get if somebody for Christmas. Uh, if you have a girlfriend, if you have a daughter or a niece, I think get in on this one. It's a really good reading and it's fun and it's fiction and it's gonna be a movie one day because I'm gonna make it a movie. And you wanna say, oh, I like the book better, hey? Uh, <laughs> and as the book concludes, sooner or later something's got to give and you, my friend, will have to get this book to find out what happens to Buente Tao. That's all we have time for right now with Angela. After the break, we catch up with one of South Africa's youngest writers, Stacey Fru. Stacey Fru is a 10-year-old multiple award-winning author who began her journey of writing at the age of seven. Stacey's first book, Smelly Cats, won the first prize of the 2016 NDA and in the Best ECD Publication 2015 Special Mention category. Other notable awards that she has received include the Young Leader 2016 Award and a Special Mention by Leader Say in November 2016. She writes books, poems, and on top of that is a motivational speaker, and she's even a ballerina. She joins us right now to share her greatness wow <laughs> like when when do you have time to be a children i have lots of time to be a child trust me i adore watching tv it's well it's not a hobby but it's like <laughs> a habit for most children uh -huh. and i'm not going to exclude myself out of that so i do get lots of time to be a child Okay, so when do you write the book? Okay, no, before we get there. Your first book, which is Smelly Cats. Smelly Cats. Okay, so how did the idea come to you? What were you doing when you sat and you were like, ping, I'm gonna write a book. Actually, it didn't come to me while sitting down. Actually, when my mother finished writing a master's thesis at UJ, I didn't know what a thesis was, and I just thought she wrote a big book without telling any of us. So I said that if mom could write a book without telling me, I would write a book without telling her. So I wrote this book without my parents knowing. And when you finally did tell them, who was the first person you allowed to read the book? The first person I allowed to read the book was my mother because she took me out and we looked over the book and we corrected the mistakes. And then, then you guys went off and you tried to find somebody who was going to publish it for you. Well, actually, the book is self-published. My mother's company published it and my mother also had a colleague who illustrated both books. Oh, my word. Okay, so I want... I haven't read your book. Can I get a little bit of it? Because, I mean, I just okay. want to see, like, you know, what everyone else is reading. Okay. Smelly Cats by Stacey Fru. Meet a cat. This particular cat was named by his uncle Jack, who called him Mac. Mac looked good, but smelled funny. Mac was Mark's cousin, and they went to the same school for six years. Mark had all the friends, while Mac had all the flies chasing him. Mark looked good and smelled like rose. Mac was sad because he could not wash himself squeaky clean. His mother only had enough water for drinking, but not enough for washing, so he was a very smelly cat. And if you'd like to know what happened to this very smelly cat and his cousin, because they get into trouble and fights and there's betrayal, so you'll have to buy the book. Betrayal. Betrayal. That is a very big word for a 10-year-old. <laughs> is the word betrayal in the book? No, but you can see a lot of it. Okay, can I please see the book? Because I want to see these illustrations that you talk about. So then, do you then sit with the your mom's friend who illustrated them and say, okay, this is what I want for this page, this is what I want for that page. Yes, well, as I'm writing the book, I'll mark it in, I'll highlight it like picture of the cat doing this or that. Mm. And then as soon as the whole book is finished, I'll send it to my mom for her to correct everything. Mm. Then she'll send it to the professional editor, then to the illustrator, then to the printers. Is your book uh, being stocked at your school? Like, is it in the syllabus where you guys do it for like, for reading study? No. Are they gonna do it? Why don't you tell them to do it? <laughs> I'm, it's actually not really in my power. It's the school's choice. Really? Yeah. Imagine you're sitting in class and then they're like, today we're going to read Smelly Cats. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> that, that's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Okay, I wanna know about Bobby uh, and the snake. Is it Bob or the snake or Bobby and the snake? Bob and the snake. What did Bob and the snake do? Bob and the snake is about a boy and a snake's relationship and cause Bob gets a snake for his birthday and he just absolutely loves snakes mm. and he's so excited to have the snake. But he also learns how to respect his parents by disrespecting his parents because in the book, Bob's parents decide not to keep the snake anymore mm. because they can't afford to and so Bob runs away and he goes to his friend's house and yeah, 
that's how he learns to respect his parents. So are you thinking of taking your books and making them like cartoons that you like sell to TV stations <laughs> or maybe like movies like Powerpuff Girls and Jungle mm. Book and all of that? That would be nice. I've never really thought about that though. I want my money if you do do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, if I do that, I'll give you the share, 25%. 25? <laughs> <laughs> Where's your mother? She must see that we're making a deal, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is absolutely amazing. So how do you come up with the titles? Do you come up with the title and then the story? Or do you come up with the story and then the title? I come up with the story, then the title, because I think it's much easier for me to... Because um, if I think of the title first, mm. then I'll technically make my whole book based on the title. But if I write the book uh. first, then I can uh. think of a more creative title uh -huh. to use. So do you dream the stories and then wake up and put it on paper? Or do you... Because I, I once read somewhere that you said... You know, you don't dream. There's no time for you to dream. You just stay awake and you make it all happen. Yes. So what's your process there? Well, the, it mostly happens in my bed. Like, as I wake up, I'm just, like, daydreaming. And then I get this idea and a thought of mm. what to put down. Then mm. I go put it down. So what other books do you read of other authors? I read um, Mallory Towers. I read books by um, Edin Blyton. Yes. I was reading one right now over there. And I also love Roald Dahl and James Patterson. Which is your favorite Roald Dahl book? The Witches. <gasps> okay. Not James the Giant Peach? No. I like James the Giant Peach. <laughs> and I like Danny the Champion of the World. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, 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 now we will. And Matilda. Matilda. Don't you think you like Matilda? What's the movie, though? You like Matilda, though. Yeah. You, it's a good book, but it's quite a small book. It is good, yeah, no, yeah. I, I hear exactly what you're saying. But you do other things. You play sports, you do ballet. What yes. other sports do you do? I play basketball, netball, and I swim. And I also do guitar and ballet. When do you get the time to do guitar and ballet and basketball and you swim and then you write books and then <laughs> you still must be a daughter and you must still have, must have friends? Yes. Um... On Mondays, I do guitar, yeah. and Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do ballet. And I do my sports at school because it's part of the school curriculum. Okay, yeah. And, yeah, that's how I manage everything. And I just write at home, and I have time for my friends. Like, I'll invite them over to the house, and, yeah. But you want to be a doctor? Yes. Like, do you know what kind of doctor? What kind? Well, I'd like to be a cardiologist, but wherever life takes me, I'll just... Follow. You'll just go there. Yeah. And if life takes you this way fully and you tour the world being a world-famous author, then that's what we do. That's what we do. Okay, quickly before you leave, do you write, like, write out or do you type and then... Fortunately, when we moved into our new house, my parents um, got computers in our room, so that was where I learned to type. And mm. my dad just gave us this program, I think, two nights ago, where you have to learn how to type it, like properly with the face keys and everything and I just find it weird because I usually just type most. yeah that's that, that's what you're comfortable with yeah okay well then stick with what you're comfortable with you are absolutely I'll phenomenal try. okay Stacy Fru we want to see you next year for Christmas for your next book there's yes. Bob and the snake the smelly cats uh, the best gift you can give a child is the gift of literacy and the space and time to daydream and be imaginative right at just 10 years old this little girl is writing her way into the hearts of many and planning to change South Africa one book at a time you're looking uh, to see what you can get your child for Christmas a book <laughs> cookbook lovers clear some space on the shelf after the break we'll look at a cookbook that could make the perfect Christmas gift for cooking lovers do join us come back At this time of the year, publishers release stacks upon stacks of cookbooks just in time for the holiday season. And we have the opportunity to chat to Chef Nompumlelo Mkoyebu. Uh, she is taking local cuisine to the world with the release of her new cookbook, Through the Eyes of an African Chef. Her book also aims to introduce authentic South African cuisine for both simple home and professional restaurant cooking. She's also the head chef of Africa Meets Europe Cuisine. And she's here today to talk about this little guy. So. I'm so glad somebody did this, right? Because I always, every time we have to talk about, you know, like South African cuisine, it's always like of second generation international people who are ultimately South African. So it's Portuguese food mm -hmm. and it's Italian food yeah. and it's Greek food. But I mean, and then our food is just deemed as traditional food and then we move on, yeah. right? Is this what you were, you know, fighting the tide against? 
Um, yes, uh, but also, um, Anele, I think what really irked me over time, especially in training, was being told that African food was unhealthy. And I would think back, most of what we ate at home, mm -hmm. growing up as a child, was steamed, boiled, belly and oil. Fresh and like, from the fresh garden. Fresh from the garden. So I would like, what do they mean it's not healthy? Uh. But then I've since learned that we actually have two kind of cuisines as African people in South Africa. Okay. We have the colonized version, okay. spikos. Okay. And then we have our food which is actually our traditional food. Oh. So when they talk about food, African food that's unhealthy, it's actually our colonized version, which will be the Poloni, which is from Bologna and Italy. Okay. The, the Russians. Oh, the so chip, they're talking fried take chips. away and yeah. fast food that is, yes. you know, okay. That we've had over time, but that's not really our no. traditional food. There was no one eating a Russian in a hut 300 we, we years ago. We didn't have a Russian. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> we didn't have turmeric. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's another one that boggles my mind, this new thing of um, the seven... Seven colors. Seven colors. And I, I've been interviewed on it as well. I'm like, where does this come from? I mean, mm. we didn't have turmeric to put in the rice. So to how make did the we get yellow to... rice. You know, how did we get to seven colors? Mm. But then it's kind of like we need to document our history. It is part of our history. People mm. eat Polony and mm. turmeric and whatnot. Look, we're not discarding, we're just, not, we're just saying that's not our cuisine. Yeah, that's not our traditional cuisine. So when we say African food is not healthy, we don't actually mean African food. Mm. Let's say it properly. Mm. The food that we inherited as part of colonization, mm. that's what's unhealthy. So uh, your dad worked on a ship as a, as a, as a chef. And uh, who owned a diner? Uh, my grandmother. Your grandmother on Dana. Yes. So obviously the lineage of cooking has always been in you. Yes, it's always been there. I was unaware. Mm -hmm. um, as you would know, I mean, growing up uh, as an African child, you know, chores and being sent to do this and that, you were never said then that, oh, now we're going to teach you how to make traditional beer. Mm -hmm. It started off as I'm young, run to the shops and go and get this malt and go and get, mm -hmm. um, you know, a maize meal and this, that. Mm -hmm. And over time, then you get involved, you're old enough to help cook Mm, um, mm. Um, you know, to start the, the porridge for the beer. Uh. And then you get old enough to now be taught, you mm, know, and you mm. know, oh, okay, that's the next process after this. I think the very first time I actually made Zulu beer all on my own, I was 21 or above. Mm. But I had been part of the process throughout the years. You were part the of the years. production line, and then now it's you. And then eventually you make it. Okay, but there's also this, like, African, I don't know if it's a myth, there's a philosophy, it's a, it's a thought that, like, not everyone's hand can make African beer. Yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you believe in that? Oh, definitely. I've seen it firsthand. I remember at that age, 21, 22, mm. um, I was still married. Mm. And we had to make Zulu beer. And me being the youngest, I had the Zulu beer mm. that really brewed very well. Ingwebu, mm -hmm. Yawela pants. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and they were like, where did you learn to make this? Like, uh, we always made it at home. Mm. And I was always part of the process. So there is a, a belief that mm. because some people will make it and it's just... It's flat. It doesn't it, boil, it, it doesn't brew. It, 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 by the second day, no one wants to drink it. Yes, yes. But then when did the, the love of cooking then go from it being a chore and something that's inherently us where, I mean, where you, you, you're cooking, when the, when the nanny's off, when the helper's off, when your mom is off, you as girls, or, or sometimes the guys, you will cook. Mm. So some, it's a chore, it's a thing to do, it's a necessity, and then you make it your passion, mm. and you, you, you're around the world and you're studying. When did that switch come through? Um, it came through, um, I think initially I, I started referring to my grandmother's sister-in-law, whom Tina Situ Kokonai. So she would teach me how to feed my kids when mm -hmm. I had young kids. She'd be like, don't buy purity. You must boil your own vegetables. You must boil this. Don't introduce anything sweet, including fruit until the child is six months old. Only after six yeah. months, then you introduce the sugar. Yeah. So she started teaching me that. And then at home, I then started cooking things differently. You know, I was cooking more fish than chicken. And each time I had friends over, everyone would comment, oh, your food is great. Mm. And I'd always help out in church and wherever. And uh, that same old, same old, you're approaching a certain age and you're thinking, 
Is this corporate world really for me? Yeah. I was in supply chain and logistics, textile dyes, chemicals. And I thought, you know what, I don't love this and I need to find my passion. And I said, okay, it was either advertising or cooking. Mm. And whichever one, I had to do it professionally and properly. So I went to a school, a kudo, school of food and wine yeah. in Morningside and I was there full time and I got into it. When did you study overseas? Uh, 2012, mm. uh, I had already worked as a chef. I had been through Zimbali, Janet's mm. restaurant and whatnot. Um, and at the time, I think there was a lot of debate around organic food and people were busy talking about, oh, it's not sustainable, um, it's not going to feed the world. We've been eating organic food. It, uh, yeah, for me, uh, again, yeah. it was one of those things like, okay, but this is what my grandmother used to do. Mm. And as far as I know history, this is what our ancestors yeah. did and sustained themselves. So how can it today not be sustainable? All of a sudden. You know? And then somebody told me about this lady, Darina Allen, who's been doing this for decades in Ireland and is running a school and a hotel mm. um, and an organic farm. So I decided to go there to live the life mm. and see that it is doable in this day mm. and age. And I must say, it was the most amazing experience. So I like in your, in your cookbook, there's, you know, traditionally, you know, like traditional dishes that are done in, in a closer way, like mussels, mm. you know, done, done the closer way. If you had to pick, let's say you like, and I'm not being morbid here, this is just, you know, say, say, if you're dying tomorrow and you have to cook your last meal today, and, it's, uh, you, and it can't be somebody else's meal, it has to be your own meal from here. Which, wh which one are you making? Um, it would be two. Um, the dessert first. Which one? It's jing. He in mind is jing. It's jing. Try it. It's says dudu. It's dudu. Uh, oh, well, okay. Uh, with, with the pumpkin. Yes, Thickened yes. with just a little bit of uh, maize meal. And I've given it a twist with cinnamon, with honey, and I serve it with berries. And my grandmother used to cook that for us, so I'm very close to that dish because it reminds me of the days I'd come back from school yeah. and it's a cold, rainy day and you'd get home, I would just smell she's cooked it. And it'd be like, mm, yeah. Okay. So I really love that dish. And? And, um, whew. The, the samp with uh, marrow? Samp with marrow, I must say, it worked with a lot of people at the launch. I found people put down the fork, and they were on that marrow <laughs> with their fingers. Yeah. And a lot of people came back to me like, wow, we love that. I love it, I love it, but I've also loved Adobe. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about Vendor Cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, I met Mam Liz, and she took me by the hand and took me through, and I thought, we have such a rich culture. Yeah. So Adobe, the pumpkin leaves with pumpkin flowers yeah. in peanut sauce. And that's a traditional vegan dish, essentially. Love it. Whew. Okay. If you're hosting guests that you want to impress and you're freaked out about preparing a big meal for a crowd this holiday season, you can get yourself a coffee of Chef Nombomelelo's latest cookbook, Through the Eyes of an African Chef, to help you craft the perfect menu for the holiday season. You heard those dishes, right? So after the break, we look into important writing lessons from first-time novelist with another young South African writer, Panaz Shigumadzi. Please stay with us. A 2007 study highlighted a sad reality in our country that only 14% of South Africans read books and half the country doesn't even own one leisure book in their home. How does one build a relationship with a book? My guest right now has a philosophical idea about our relationship with books and reading culture. She's a writer, founding editor of Vanguard magazine and the author of the novel Sweet Medicine, which won the 2016 K. Selo Dega Literary Award. And her short story, Small Death, was nominated for the 2016 Pushcart Literary Prize. Her debut novel, Sweet Medicine, is set in Harare and explores the journey undertaken by a young black Catholic girl in an effort to find romance and financial security through worldly means. She was also the curator of the inaugural Mzanzi Literary Festival, Abandi Book Festival in 2016, ran masterclass in writing and has just returned from the University of Iowa after taking part in the International Writers Program. 
Oh, girl, you are everything. <laughs> I think after we had uh, little Stacy, I just remember reevaluating my entire life. Uh, you know, so <laughs> I was like, listen, guys, whatever you do with your life, <laughs> with your kids. If my kids are not writing books by the time they are two, okay, I failed. You know, so, I want a yeah, thesis yeah. by age five. Exactly. I want a library by <laughs> age ten, and yeah, I want yeah. I want an empire yeah, by I, twenty. I just had the whole world. Just, okay, I need to reevaluate. It's December. I need to have my goals at the beginning of the year. So, yeah. Okay, but come yeah, on now. Yeah, You've yeah. done pretty well yourself, right? When mm -hmm. my, my, the most thing I'm curious about mm -hmm. is how does one have a writing workshop? Because I mm -hmm. feel like writing is such. Yes, the more you write, the better you get. But it's such an like an integral skill. Like mm -hmm. it's an it's an inner thing in you. How do you mm -hmm. teach someone to have that? You know, I think writing is almost like it's something like singing or cooking, something that everybody technically can do, provided that you sort of, you know, either go to school or you're mm. taught by your mom or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, but it's something that you have to work at. I mean, there's no writer, no matter how great you are, no matter what innate talent you have, mm. I think you always have to work at it, mm. at it you know. So mm. just like with Nombu Malelo just now, she spoke about the fact that, yes, she might have had the hand, but she still went and, you know, she taught herself, she went to school and uh, she invested in herself. Uh. Um, and so I'm not so much prescriptive about you must go to school. I mean, I studied accounting. That was my, my undergrad was, was accounting. Mm. Um, and the best thing I would say for writers, even before we can think about workshops, if you don't read, you cannot be a writer. It's like being a cook mm. or a chef, but you don't eat food. Mm. You need to read, mm. read, read. Mm. And I think for most Why people... Why is that? Well, I mean, it's like someone saying, I want to be a film director, but I've never, you know... Watch I've, I've never watched yeah. film. You have to have that love of, of, of books and yeah. reading. Um, and it's not to say you have to love every single book, but you need to find what works for you. Um, as, as, as a reader, um, and from there, that love of literature, because it means that you are reading a variety of styles, mm. you're reading a variety of just ways of doing, just like, you know, any person, I'd imagine if you were um, a chef, you'd want to go, wherever you go, if you go to, I don't know, Thailand, you'd want to go to all the different yeah, markets. you want to eat you, the food. You want to eat all the f different food, exactly. So that's uh, the way I would think about writing, that you really have to be interested in reading. If you don't really mm. care for reading, um, Maybe you can just get a ghostwriter or whatever, but I really wouldn't take you seriously as a writer if you don't care for books. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 we're not going to do that. So mm -hmm. when did you then, like, you mm -hmm. know, because obviously you said you studied accounting. Yeah. So when you were studying accounting, did you always know that writing is something that you're going to, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately do and take it as seriously as starting an entire literary festival? Well, I mean, the thing about writing, it's, it's as, as I think Angela had mentioned, it's not something that we're at the point where many of us can live off of, uh -huh. right? Um, and it's one of those careers, I think maybe it's something you might have experienced mm. within your career. It's not the kind of careers that particularly for black kids, our parents are saying, yeah, go and be a writer. And mm. with, with good reason, because it's not something that you necessarily can make money out of or necessarily can make a living from. Mm. So I, I always loved English, I always loved history, all kinds, those kinds of subjects. But, um, and I did really well at school, but you know, when I said I wanted to do that, my parents were like, no child of ours mm. is going to do that, you know? So I kind of also just decided, never mind, and mm. I just bought into that. Um, um, but I always, eventually I would continue sort of just doing that in the background here and there, but there was a point where I thought, actually, this is what I really yeah. want to do. But I also had to be strategic about this, and this was maybe my third year of accounting. And so I thought, you know, Accounting, literally, if anyone knows what that's like, that's literally you do not do any sort of writing it's or numbers, anything. You're describing a building. It's enter. number, enter, <laughs> enter, debit, credit, you know. So eventually I thought to myself, you know, maybe I can be smart and maybe the conjecture or the, the idea that I had was maybe let me go and get into journalism. Let me do business journalism yeah. because I can use the skills that I use from uh -huh. accounting. And then so I was like, and then maybe I can get into cultural journalism and then maybe I can be a writer. That was literally uh -huh. the plan that I had because there was no way I was going to tell my parents I'm quitting accounting to become a writer. writer it does doesn't work right and so that sort of my it worked that was actually my journey and then sort of working through media and whatnot i did sort of like cnbc africa forbes africa then mm. eventually i started vanguard um and in that time i sort of started um I'd, I'd write early in the morning. And there's many writers who started like that. You know, you write early in the morning, or maybe some people are, are mm. night people. Mm. You know, you do that. So you have to really sort of invest in yourself mm. and do it. And writing really is a very lonely kind of, of work because you have to be by yourself and mm. you have to sit down and, and get down to it. 
what a fascinating story. Mm. And in terms of, you know, lots of people hear about, oh, I've got righteous block, I've got righteous block, <laughs> righteous yeah, block. Yeah. Okay, I is it really a thing and how do you overcome it? Well, I'll give you a less romantic version of it. I think it's also just one, again, even as I continue to write, it's always about, you know, sometimes people say before you write, you need to have some experience. Or even like you think about a singer sometimes, you say, mm. that person is singing, but you don't really identify with the experience. Yeah. They haven't lived, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and sometimes writing, you have to, I almost think of it as a banking system. You need to live a little, you need to read a lot, you need to go and experience different things so that you're able uh -huh. to write. Wrap yourself up against it, life. Exactly, yeah. right? Because that's what you're writing about yeah. ultimately. Like, you know, Angela was talking about when you're thinking about the blessings or whatever, you have to be part of the world in order to write. And so for for me, I think of it as those kind of cycles where sometimes I'll have a lot to write because yeah. there's a lot happening, and other times I really have nothing to say. There's or there's nothing that that comes in, and I think it, it works in those yeah. cycles. That it is it is frustrating sometimes where you really I think before I even went on that writing program, yeah. um, in Iowa, I literally had not written anything in two months, and that was very scary. Um, but once I was in a different environment and I'd been reading a lot and just consistently banking and banking and mm. banking, I found that it was really easy to write. So it really does go in, in cycles. And I wouldn't say it's writer's block. Maybe it's just, a, you know, it's, it's like harvesting mm. and, and sometimes you have to go and plow and mm. you, you have to work in those kind of cycles. Okay, so I'm a terrible liar, so I'm not going <laughs> to say I read this, but yeah. I'm going to read it and then you're mm. going to come back because yeah. I really think you're yeah. great and I think a lot of people need to hear a lot from you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read the sweet mm -hmm. medicine and then you're going to come back here and then we're yeah. going to have a chat about this. Yeah. But thank you for this. Oh, thank you. Thank for you. Me here. Okay, <laughs> look, so yes, you and I, let's read it and then let's meet back here and talk to Panasha about her book, okay? Look out for Panasha's forthcoming book on the interwoven politics of hair and land. Woo! So titled Beautiful Hair. The conversation on books you are reading these holidays continues on our social media pages. What has made it onto your summer reading list? What books have changed your life? Hit us up on social media. Make sure you use the hashtag Summer Reading on 3 for myself and the rest of the team. Have yourself a lovely weekend and a joyous Christmas. Until next time, bye for now.